So this is called Questions for Disciples of the Modern Religion Known as Censorship. Question A. If a given platform counters the inertia of speech destruction by catering to popular pariahs, how does that impact the market economy? Question 2 or question B. Should depersoning extend to the right to prosper? Huh. And question C. How much control should the algorithm retain? Well, these are interesting questions. Once again, leave me a comment below with your thoughts and observations on these. How you believe they should be answered. Give me your subjective viewpoint and provide some objective pointers, however you'd like to do it. So the first question, if a given platform counters the inertia of speech destruction, well, that's strong, speech destruction. If a given platform counters that inertia, the destruction of speech, by catering to popular pariahs, how does that impact the market economy? Well, if you're on Gab, you know a little bit about that. I recently saw Alex Jones's profile there, and I'm like, whoa, Alex Jones is on Gab. And you should be too. Check out their Dissenter app, www.dissenter.com. Let's you comment on any URL online. They also have their free speech web browser. Check it out. And Gab, of course, is an alternative, a free market alternative to Twitter. It is a social media platform that ha offers a very similar, very similar format. And I am real Jeff Tidwell over there. So, if you cater to a popular pariah, so Alex Jones is a great case in point. Here's a popular pariah. Here's somebody, along with InfoWars, that was completely depersoned and deplatformed. Um, not every individual from InfoWars lost their account. Paul Joseph Watson is still on Twitter. He's still on Minds. He's still around. But really, it does impact the market economy because people, once... A platform destroys speech, which is also known as censorship. Okay, Once they follow the prophets of the modern religion that is censorship, and they start to silence voices, and they start to remove content, they start to remove perspectives, certain topics become off-limits, Okay, they, they try to create an uh, environment, an echo chamber, where everybody can get on the same page, and that window, that Overton window of acceptable dialogue drops to a point where, you know, you, if you get outside that window, you can't be on our platform. We'll call it things like the arbitrary definition, hate speech. We'll say it's hate speech. We'll, we'll give another reason. We'll say the advertisers aren't happy. We'll say that there's hateful conduct. What is hateful conduct? Is critiquing somebody or disagreeing with somebody hateful conduct? But it does impact the market economy because people will need to go to other places. They'll need to use other services, other products, to get the information that you were providing in the first place. If you censor somebody, if you remove their voice, they'll have to go somewhere else. They'll have to go from Twitter to Gab. I say you should have an account on both places and certainly uh, help promote the free market. But, yeah, I'd say it certainly impacts it in, in, in other ways, too, in many other ways. Forgive me for any failures of imagination during this video. I'm still warming up after a week off. So the next question here is, should depersoning extend to the right to prosper? So, yeah, if somebody is a human being and they're living in a country, for example, that you know, offers them the right to prosper, the United States, you should have a right to prosper. You should have, uh, I'm not sure if that's actually in the Constitution, correct me if I'm wrong, in the comments section below, send me a tweet. Um, but uh, should depersoning extend to the right to prosper? I think that that's going a little bit far. Now, depersoning isn't just deplatforming. Depersoning is when you essentially remove somebody from the greater internet, the greater society, the greater world. It's not just taking somebody's voice away. It's saying, well, you can't bank. You can't exist in the world. You're, you, you can't have any hosting. There's no 
you know, even, you know, just because my platform doesn't like you, depersoning involves a whole other slew of, of controls to get that person away and limit their right to prosper. They, they can't prosper because everybody's blackballed them. They've been blacklisted. So I don't think that depersoning should happen to begin with, but uh, if it extends to the right to prosper, that really just destroys, that really does deperson. It goes beyond speech destruction. It destroys a person. It's almost like, you know, it's uh, exiling. It's creating a pariah. It is anti-human. To do that, it's not very um, conducive to the kind of civilization I think that we uh, we have intended these past few hundred years with the founding fathers and the Enlightenment and all this other stuff that's gone on. I don't think we want to be completely depersoning people. Although there are some cases where it might be more socially accepted, the consensus will decide. Um, I would not be, want to be the one to, to choose for sure. And how much control should the algorithm retain? Questions for disciples of censorship. How much control should the algorithm retain? So the algorithm is, of course, designed by human beings, but ultimately it's used to direct blame. They say, well, it wasn't human decision that had this person deplatformed or censored or they had their account suspended or banned for 24, 48 hours, a week, whatever it might be, 30 days. It was the algorithm. It's just all, we, you know, it's like the postmodern ideology thing. We're a little, get a little bit of separation there. We, we don't know what's going on with the algorithm. We designed it. But we don't know what's going on. It, could, it acts uh, independently. It, does, it has its own agency. That's the algorithm. The algorithm controls everything. It controls what you see. It controls what I see. It controls what we hear. It controls a lot. It controls how we think. You know, if we see the same messaging again and again, or we see a lack, a dearth, it, it can go either in a positive direction or a negative direction. Whatever information we get, that determines our decisions. You know, of course, some would say that we, if you're working within the realm of rational free will, your brain makes the decision, and you rationalize it later. Um, you know, I will say something, but my, you know, my brain kind of already knew what was coming. There was already this, this incentive structure built in, and I'm just, you know, we're kind of along for the ride. Of course, I also, I personally like to believe and refer to irrational free will. That's the human free will that we all enjoy. Uh, where we make rational decisions and we make irrational decisions, and there's, you never know just how rational your decision-making process is. Um, but that's a little bit off-topic. How much control should the algorithm retain? Well, it has a lot of control. I don't think it should have as much as it does. But again, uh, someone asked me what to what degree. I think the algorithm should control things. Um, I think that in my world. In my perfect world, my subjectively perfect world, since perfection is a fallacy, I would like the algorithm to maybe, you know, uh, you'd be able to direct it, you know, to show you what you'd like to see. But right now, the algorithm is really operating on a number of us. And again, the algorithm changes depending on which platform you're on, which program you're using, which people, which company. It's There is no one algorithm, obviously. Uh... But I would say I don't think the algorithm should have high control to direct what the narrative is or what people are seeing and doing. I think there should be a little bit more ability for a person to create their, uh, curate, I should say, their own feed and their own, uh, own, their own information intake. If they're intellectual and they're addicted to information, they want more knowledge, they should be the ones to determine... Uh, how they get it, but of course, in this world we live in, where they we have the powers that be, we have these um, immense post government post governmental tech companies. Um, some call it the you know social media the fifth estate. We have all this stuff going on. It's really difficult. We're getting to a point in time where uh, we are losing control of the process, and really the only ones that have that control 
and even even they don't know, quite know exactly what's going on. Are these massive tech companies, these Facebooks, these Twitters, YouTube, Google, Amazon, Apple, they have their algorithm, and we've seen a little bit using the leaks from Project Veritas, we have seen a little bit of how social engineering takes place in the information age. Um, but I like to give, as an individualist, and somebody that believes in individual agency over collective thought and hive mind thinking and groupthink, I like to give as much individual agency and control to the user as possible. So that's kind of where I fall on that. But, yeah, these are some interesting questions for the disciples of the modern religion known as censorship.